So we've heard a little bit about the administration efforts and the various uh, policies and uh, proposals that it has been uh, working with. But now we have three individuals who are right on the front lines in different aspects of the STEM fields. These are individuals who have been uh, working uh, very hard on these uh, topics, have uh, put out a range of uh, different types of uh, proposals to advance uh, STEM education and uh, teacher uh, training. So we wanted to kind of add uh, a variety of perspectives in terms of where we are now and uh, what we need uh, to uh, do. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Jim uh, Simons is president of Euclidean Capital and board chairman of Renaissance uh, Technologies. Dr. Charles Vest is president of the National Academy of Engineering and president emeritus and professor uh, President Emeritus and Professor of uh, Mechanical Engineering at uh, MIT, and Charles Giancarlo is Managing Director and Head of Value uh, Creation for uh, uh, Silver Lake uh, Partners. So I want to start with uh, Jim uh, Simons and uh, get his uh, perspective. Uh, you've uh, founded an organization, Math for America, that's doing a lot to <coughs> try and improve uh, math uh, education and teaching in uh, public uh, schools. Uh, what do you think needs to get done? What would advance uh, the uh, STEM education field? Well, I'm, I'm kind of a one-trick pony in this subject because my view is that without knowledgeable and inspiring teachers, this whole enterprise cannot move forward. And it's perfectly clear that we have a shortage of such teachers of science and math, in particular in the upper grades, junior high and high school. Without addressing that issue, not much else is going to happen. Now, why don't we have such the kind of teachers who know the subject and are inspiring, the kind of teachers that we'd really like to have of those subjects? It's simple. As Rebecca pointed out, STEM jobs are increasing at a rapid rate. If you know enough to teach math in high school, you know enough to get a job at Google, or at Microsoft, or at Pfizer, or wherever STEM jobs are available and growing. Now, by know enough to teach math in high school, I mean no more than high school math. I mean, no college mathematics, uh, some applications, whatever it is. And if you don't have that level of training, you're not going to be effective. But if you do have that level of training, the job of being, let's say, a high school math teacher is simply not very attractive. Plain and simple. So if you want more people to be in a certain line of work, you have to make that line of work more attractive. You have to make it more attractive with better pay, with better working conditions. Whatever the private sector would do if they had a shortage of people in a given category, you have to do the same thing in this teaching sector. And simply training people to do these jobs is not enough because if the job isn't very good, they might enter, but they're not going to stay. If they really are prepared, if they are knowledgeable enough to teach math and science in high school, and they're urged and given scholarships and all the rest, prepare for a, that career, fine. They'll prepare for a career. But soon they'll discover this career is not very good. I don't get paid enough. I don't get enough respect. So recognizing that problem we created this Math for America about eight years ago to make the job of high school teaching, we focused on high school teaching, secondary school teaching, to make that job better and consequently attract people into the field who wouldn't otherwise have come and keep people in the field who are on the verge of leaving. So how do you make a job better? We pay them on top of their teacher's salaries. We actually pay them more. We don't do it through the school board. That would be problematic. We just make them uh, members of our core, and they get paid a certain amount of money on top of their salary. Secondly, we make them feel like they're part of something important. We have meetings. We have lunches. We have uh, support sessions and one thing or another. 
So, but this group, which is now in New York City, for example, about 350 teachers of mathematics, is excited, is, feels important, feels rewarded. They're not going anywhere. They like these jobs. They like the extra pay. And they like the fact that they're treated in a way that's just plain better. So you can put computers in the classrooms. You can train people to go into teaching till you're blue in the face. But if you don't make that job better, then you're not going to be able to retain the kind of people you want, precisely because the economy is growing more and more in the STEM direction. So I'd like to see a program like Math for America, which we're in the process of growing, at least in New York, to about eight or, or 900 teachers. That'll be about 8% of the math teachers, maybe math and science teachers, in the New York City public schools. And they're all over the schools. They're not just in the uh, you know, Stuyvesant and Bronx science, nor are they concentrated in the uh, most disadvantaged. They're spread all around, because this problem of not having teachers of math and science in our secondary schools who know the subject is everywhere. It's in Larchmont, it's in Beverly Hills, and it's in, you name your favorite slum or whatever. It's all over. So, and the solution is exactly what the solution would be, I'll say again, if this were the private sector. Make the job better and qualified people will come. So that's my, uh, that's my little pitch. OK. Uh, Charles Vest, uh, you've spent most of your life in higher education. So Jim has uh, focused uh, more on uh, K to 12. Uh, what is the situation at the university level? Uh, what about the, you know, what you're seeing coming out of the high schools as it relates to uh, colleges and universities? Great. Well, <clears throat> what I would like to do is going to be a consistent with what Secretary Blank had to say, and B, ultimately going to tie back to what my good friend uh, and uh, hero Jim Simons just had to say. We have a problem with STEM in this country. And I would like to throw out there that we especially have a problem with the E, <coughs> engineering, and we have an even bigger problem with the T technology that we're probably not going to get into today because I at least am not much of an expert there. Let me focus for a minute, therefore, at the bachelor's level in engineering and to a certain extent in science. Looking over 30 plus years, the number of engineers we graduate in the United States each year has been stagnant and indeed has declined somewhat. But what has happened during that period of time? Countries, including countries as small as Japan, North Korea, now educate more, graduate more engineers per year than we do. And we don't even want to begin to talk about China, which graduates over 10 times as many as we do. But on the other hand, there are a lot of reasons why they need to be doing that. So what I'd like to do is sort of normalize this and ask of all the men and women that we educate at the university and college level, what fraction of them go into these fields? And if you do that, you will find that you really need to disaggregate science and engineering. Because across Asia, across Europe, and across uh, North America, about 13%, plus or minus a couple percent, of all our college and university graduates major in science. It's almost constant across Asia, Europe, the US, about 13%. If you look at engineering across the Asian countries, it's about 21% and growing of their university graduates are engineers. Across Europe, it's about 12.5%. At the United States, it's 4.5%. So no matter how you slice it in terms of opportunity or what have you, we are not educating enough people in STEM fields in general, and we especially are not educating, in my view, enough engineers. 4.5%, remember that. Then I would like to 
pick up with what the issues look like around our underrepresented minority groups and women in, uh, in engineering in particular, where I know the numbers better, but we're going to talk a little science too, that kind of leads to the picture in the workforce that Secretary Blank talked about. And I hope you'll forgive me for throwing a few numbers out here, but I'd like you to kind of listen carefully, try to paint a fairly simple picture. If you ask students coming into U.S. universities, what do you plan to major in? Here's what you will find. 13% of the women coming into universities in the U.S. say, I'm going to be a science major, natural science, physics, chemistry, math, and so forth. 13% of the men will say, I'm going to be a science major. So that's great. What happens four years, five years later when they graduate? It's very interesting. You've lost almost 30% of the women who came in to study science. About 30% have peeled off and done something else. Among the men, believe it or not, you graduate about 20% more in science fields than said they plan to be scientists coming in. So if you kind of have that picture in your mind, now let's look at engineering. Only 3%, 3.1% specifically, of the women coming into college and university in the U.S. say they want to major in engineering, 3.1%. About 17% uh, uh, of the men coming in say, I'm going to graduate in engineering. So what's the reality at the end of this time? Remember what I said about science, now in engineering, you find you lose 50% of the women on the way through, and you lose 50% of the men on the way through. So that's kind of the big picture. Now if we drop down and look at sort of various uh, ethnic groups and so forth, I begin to get really scared. Because what has happened so far, what it is we have to figure out how to turn around, is that the population of 18, 19 year olds, 18 to 23 year olds, sort of college age as we tend to think of it, of kids in the United States who are African American is growing. The percentage in this age range who are Hispanic American kids is growing really rapidly. And yet the percentage of these who go into STEM fields is much lower than it is among the uh, uh, white kids and the Asian kids, and they're not showing much movement. So if it continues that the growing segments of your population continue to go in their present low percentage into these fields, we're going to be graduating even fewer scientists and engineers. So as I think about all this together, um, I think we have three basic things we're going to do. I'm going to be not quite as basic as Jim, but not, not far from it. First of all, I think we have to really work at our messaging, at societal views, at transmitting the excitement of science and engineering and mathematics and information technology, especially, the surveys tell us, in uh, uh, helping young people to understand that if they really want to change the world and solve our great challenges, these are the core fields that they should be considering going into. I think, by the way, the entertainment industry literally has to be our biggest ally in this because one of the great things about America is we don't tell people what fields to go into. We have to motivate them, excite them. And I think some of that has to take place outside the, um, the classroom. Secondly, I just want to give a, a vigorous vote for uh, what Jim has said about uh, secondary education, about the teacher corps. You know, if, if, uh, if I were the president, I think the first thing I'd say to our nation is, I want to make teaching the most respected profession in the country. If you start with that mindset, a lot can, can be done, but we have to fix the K-12 issues, not just for the people we want to be professional scientists and engineers, 
but really for the whole workforce has got to have a better STEM background and a better understanding. And then finally, if you go back to what I said of losing 50% of both men and women going through engineering schools, we in engineering schools have to improve what we do. And I've got some thoughts on that, but this isn't really the time to, uh, to dwell on that. So that's my main point. Social views and messaging about the excitement and importance of STEM fields as careers. Secondly, get serious, as Jim has done, about making a difference at the K-12 level. And third, I think we have some improvement in our university education that has to be brought about as well. Thank you. Uh, Charles Giancarlo, uh, you have spent most of your life in the uh, private sector, so you see what comes out of uh, uh, colleges and uh, universities. Uh, what are you seeing? What needs to get done? Yeah, thanks very much, Joe. You know, it strikes me that this is one of the few controversies we have in this country where there's complete agreement on what uh, on the problems and and the, the foundation. Uh, I have to just echo uh, both of uh, what uh, uh, Jim and Charles have said regarding um, the state of education. I can now talk about what we see uh, as we recruit. And just to give you, again, a, a few numbers, um, you know, as uh, head of Cisco R&D, we had about 24,000 um, engineers, but pretty much the entire population of about 65,000 people were technically trained in, in one way or another. Uh, and as in charge of Silver Lake, our corporations have about 87 or so thousand uh, technically trained uh, individuals. Now think about those numbers for a moment. We graduate roughly 86,000 um, students per year out of either um, undergraduate or graduate with uh, undergraduate or graduate degrees, right? So, you know, you have one one U.S. corporation that has a full year's worth of U.S. graduates, and you realize very very quickly that the uh, demand cannot be fully fulfilled at this point in time simply by the graduation rates that we have, at least out of the engineering school. And I, Charles, your, your point about engineering and, and other sciences, I think, being, being very much correct. But if you look at um, the, uh, the large um, US uh, technical base, whether it's in um, engineering-oriented fields or biological or chemical-oriented fields, you realize right now that there is not enough um, supply to meet the demand uh, that the U.S. Uh, in its, uh, incredible, with its incredible innovation uh, can draw from our own schools. Now, you take upon that the fact that, um, again, I'll use the engineering uh, standard, uh, over half of the engineering graduates uh, out, of, uh, out of graduate school, uh, that is with advanced degrees, are foreign-born. If you look at, uh, if you look at um, Rebecca's statistics this morning, take all of STEM, 35% of graduate degrees are to foreign uh, born. And realize that we only reserve um, 65,000, there's an extra 20,000 now, so 85,000 H-1B visas for technically trained uh, individuals in the US. And what you realize again very, very quickly is we're educating students only to send them back. Uh, it, it, it's a crime uh, in the first place that we have to draw them from overseas, but then it's pouring salt in our own wound uh, to actually send them back home for lack of H-1B visas. And this has been a, a severe problem. It has forced U.S. corporations to go overseas. Uh, we, uh, one of the things that is occurring uh, dramatically in Silicon Valley is not only uh, the percentage of the workforce within uh, high-tech companies that is foreign born, but the increasing number of overseas workers that we are using uh, with advanced degrees in, in engineering, computer science, et cetera. In fact, it had gotten so bad at one point with H-1B visas that Cisco opened up a Vancouver uh, R&D site because Canada would accept the, uh, the very um, workers that Cisco wanted to hire. Uh, so we had to open R&D overseas in order to do that. Uh, but we also opened facilities in India and China. Uh, the, uh, it was uh, re remarked upon before... Um, just how many uh, students on, uh, were taking up um, ed, uh, advanced degrees and advanced uh, studies in mathematics, engineering, computer science, et, et cetera, in India and China. And for global corporations, frankly, these days, it's almost impossible not to avail yourself of the incredible talent that's over there. I, I, I can tell you directly that the, uh, 
uh, the quality of these uh, graduates uh, overseas is tremendous. Uh, these, are, these are very, very capable students. And even though some of the numbers that are discussed, such as, for example, 600,000 engineering uh, students per year in, in China, in spite of the fact that some of that 600,000 would be more properly qualified as, uh, technical, um, as technical training or technical uh, school graduates in the U.S., still the numbers are, are uh, quite uh, daunting. So if we were to fix this problem, um, really there are two ways about it. We have to make ourselves either more attractive to foreign students to come and then stay in the U.S. through opening up our H-1B visa problem, or ha as Jim has mentioned, we need to dramatically increase the number of Americans, uh, native-born Americans, who are graduating from our schools. And in order to do that, it's, it's very clear that that preparation starts in, in K through 12. I couldn't agree more with Jim that we need to simply improve the salaries. However, I think we also need to broaden our uh, qualifications. Uh, one, one anecdote and then, um, or two anecdotes and then I'll move on. Uh, most, I think most people that follow scientific careers can often point to a very influential, uh, influential teacher that they had in, uh, middle school and or uh, high school. Uh, I was very fortunate that I had two. Uh, and in both, uh, one was in math, uh, one was in the, in the sciences. In both cases, they were retired professionals who decided to teach uh, after retiring from, uh, from private industry. And the remarkable thing about, uh, about that background is not only do they bring in a love of the subject, uh, but they bring in the actual experience of having spent a life uh, in, in technical fields. Uh, there's really almost nothing that can be more inspiring to a group of young people, and I, I really believe that uh, we should make greater use of retired professionals in, our, in uh, K through 12. Secondly, we do need to, uh, there was a woman in the back, I, 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 sorry, I, I didn't catch the name, who had asked about uh, using more new technologies and broadband in schools. And I encourage everyone here to take a look at, and I have no affiliation uh, with this group other than being an ardent admirer, uh, but with the uh, Khan Academy, which is something that was started in, in California, uh, which is uh, a fellow who, who came to the U.S. and uh, decided that he, uh, he was actually, believe it or not, a hedge fund manager, uh, retired from being a hedge fund manager and decided to teach mathematics to his cousins, used YouTube to do it. And now there are over, I believe the number, if I'm not mistaken, is 90,000 videos in math and science and his, uh, and with a lot of software now to be able to support uh, training. And his view is that we should be giving lectures at home and homework at school uh, that allow the students to learn the lessons in a broadcast manner from you know, highly skilled lecturers while they're at home and use the one-on-one -on -one training and the individual attention that can be given by, by teachers in the schools at school. And it's a remarkable um, program that has been initiated and really makes use of the new technologies to fundamentally change the nature of uh, schooling in K through 12. Thank you. Uh, there's another question I'd like to throw out for everyone on the panel, and then we'll open the floor to uh, questions and comments uh, uh, from you. Uh, and my question is, what do you think the administration should do uh, that would make the biggest difference in terms of improving the uh, STEM uh, situation, and what should uh, Congress do? If there are specific proposals that you think would make a, a big difference here, uh, what would those proposals be? Start with Jim. Right. Well, I was up here about a year ago uh, to talk about the PCAST report that had just come out. Uh, President's Council and whatever it is, anyway, the science guys. <laughs> I can never remember these acronyms. In any event, the PCasters uh, cast a report, and there were two things aimed at teachers uh, that w w would be good. One was this 100,000 uh, you know, scholarships to get 100,000 people into the, into the field of STEM teaching. This, this report was all about STEM. Uh, STEM. But uh, the other was a, uh, to create a core of master teachers. Uh, and it's that that uh, I feel is far and away the more important of the two. And if the government did only one thing, it would be to create a core of master STEM teachers. It would be transformational uh, if it's uh, done on a big enough scale and cost a few billion dollars a year. And I, I just think it would change a lot of things fast. 
And I noticed in that PCAS report, uh, the administration uh, advisory group called for 100,000 new STEM uh, teachers. Dr. Blank, when she was here, uh, gave us the figure of they've delivered on 10,000. Uh, so there still is a long way to go. But again, you can train them, but if the job's no good, they're not going to stay too long. So. Yeah. But okay. uh, let others answer. Charles? Well, I, I, you know, the, uh, um, I've seen several reports. It's something I, I tried to research uh, uh, before coming here, and the data is, is very unclear. But STEM teachers really are not paid very much. Uh, you know, the data indicates it's a de minimus amount more than, than, uh, than, yeah. other, than other teachers. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, it's amazing that in training our workforce into our capitalist uh, environment that we, um, that supply and demand does not seem to be a lesson that operates among, uh, among K through 12 teachers. Uh, because clearly STEM, uh, uh, STEM profession, or um, people with STEM training, undergraduate STEM training make up less than 10% of the teachers who teach STEM in K through 12. Think of that. Uh, very hard to inspire when you don't even have the, the fundamental background. Um, uh, I think one of the things the administration could do, uh, if you look at all of the both government and private um, uh, uh, support for STEM in, in, in school that has to do with teacher salaries, less than 1% of STEM teachers are touched by that additional uh, support. And so the one thing that is, really needs to happen is dramatically increased uh, stipends for STEM teaching, both STEM teaching and, te and STEM facilities, frankly. Uh, Charles Vest, I want to hear your uh, thoughts on what the administration and Congress should do. But I also want to note you know, a comment you made that you think it's important to make teaching the most respected field. It seems like there are a lot of trends in society and politics moving in the other direction right now. Well. <laughs> I, I was going to make two points. The first one speaks to that and costs nothing. This president is a great communicator. He has the ability to appeal to young people and excite them. He needs to be continuously using the bully pulpit to talk about why this is important, what the, the opportunities are for young people in STEM <coughs> disciplines. He's been pretty good about this. He could do more. So I would start with that. Secondly, uh, I just am again going to agree with, uh, with Jim. If you go all the way back uh, seven years now to the National Academies rising above the gathering storm report as well as the new PCAST report, the first recommendation in all of them has been to create some form of a fellowship program that allows young women and men to go to university and major in mathematics, in physics, in computer science, in electrical engineering, in these true STEM fields, and become qualified to teach in the K-12 system. And then, as Jim eloquently points on, the second piece is to make this respected and, uh, and uh, appropriately paid thereafter. That's what every one of these reports has said is job one, and it's still job one as far as I'm concerned. Okay, uh, let's open the floor to uh, any questions and comments you have uh, right here in the third row. No, it's still good morning. Good morning. Okay, great. Yep. My name is Lachelle Hatley. I'm from a local nonprofit here in D.C. called Uplift Inc. Um, I run a STEM after school program where I teach the engineering and technology, specifically um, robotics and software development by way of uh, smartphone application development to middle and high school students, and actually one of our students is eight, eight years old. Um, uh, I wanted to ask two questions, not really related. The first is, how can a nonprofit like mine, um, I guess, become more valuable or visible in terms of partnership, in terms of funding? Um, we, we nurture, we stay after school as long as the kids want to stay there. We kind of model ourselves as MIT Media Lab, and we're working on a lot of problems. Um, and solutions in terms of technology and engineering. But how do we actually get more exposure to funding sources, partnerships, so that we can kind of broaden our um, program? Um, I was one of those teachers you talk about in terms of, uh, I have a, I'm an engineer, bachelor's degree, uh, master's in computer science, I'm working on my PhD now. I taught for three years, it was extremely boring. <laughs> um, I had to see the same curriculum all the time, so that's why I started to start at my own organization. Um, the second point, so that's one question, how, how can we get more exposure to funding and partnerships? 
Um, the second question is, in terms of graduate level and the, the point that you spoke to in terms of in, improving um, higher education, um, unfortunately, no one's speaking to the faculty members at these um, institutions in terms of how they deliver their lessons and their support. So for instance, I mentioned how much we nurture our stu students after school. However, when they go off to uh, college and graduate school, when engineering and technology gets difficult, who's there to support them? I say that because one teacher or there, there's a known trend that in computer science classes, faculty members um, almost are proud of the fact that no one passed their exams. Um, and so they just have this, it's, it's sort, of, sort of counterproductive. It's, it's a weeding out process more than an encouraging process. And I'd, I would love for the Brookings, Brookings Institute or someone else to do some type of study on the perspective of the faculty and how they do their messaging and, and their societal views in their class because it's not what we're talking about right now. It's definitely a weeding out process. Um, and I was, just another example, a friend of mine was applying for a computer science PhD program at a local university. She is an African-American woman. In her interview with him, she asked him, um, are there any minority uh, faculty members in the computer science department? And he said, come on, this is computer science. Oh. So it's, it's, it's yeah, I, I, I so, totally, the second question is, you know, can someone do a study or just some type of professional development on the faculty level of universities because I think they're the missing link in terms of how to improve what happens after K through 12. Because okay. we're nurturing K through Okay, uh, panelists, responses? Let me make a quick comment in response to the, the second part of, of what you talked about. Uh, first of all, I have to tell you, uh, I'm actually very optimistic. I have seen, at least across the, and I hate to sound elitist, but the leading public and private universities around the country, over the last 10, 20 years, I've seen a great improvement in attitude toward the importance of learning, of education, of project-based uh, uh, teaching, and so forth. I think it's coming. I think the new generation of faculty have a very different attitude. It's not out of the whole system. But I will tell you, if you go to the University of Illinois, or you go to Berkeley, or you go to MIT, you're not going to hear faculty saying, our job's to weed kids out. They would view that as a most old-fashioned thing. So I think it's coming. Now, this is just a little bit of what I call guerrilla warfare. But in the National Academies, we have some very well-known programs called Frontiers of Science, Frontiers of Engineering. And what we do is bring 100, in each case roughly, of the, the really fast molecules, the really highly accomplished young to mid-career scientists or engineers together. And, uh, spend two or three days letting them learn from each other and move their innovations out and so forth. And this is focused on research and industrial practice. We've just started two years ago a program called Frontiers of Engineering Education. And the goal is to do the same thing. Get the innovative young faculty members at the, at the university level together and let them learn from each other and cause some of their innovative approaches to learning and education to propagate around the system and frankly to give them the imprimatur of the National Academy so what you're doing as a teacher is really important and again if you'll excuse me for being uh, a little bit blunt we get a great mix of kinds of institutions so that we hope that they all see that at Caltech, they think education is really important. And I think this builds prestige a little bit like what we need to do in, in K-12. So that's one little thing that we're trying to do. Uh, over there is a question. This time I'm speaking from supercomputing. I'm a teacher who works with broadening engagement. And there are only a few programs that most kids who are in urban areas ever see. I walk up in Jordan, I saw a truck. It said New York Institute of Technology. I've never seen one of those in the ghetto. So I'm wondering, who are the people who will bring Alexander Rapin? He has the most absolutely wonderful program. He took a bunch of teachers, including me, uh, older teachers, and taught us how to program, how to make games. Why isn't that replicated? Why do you have to pay for it yourself? NSF does help us 
by showing us the example. But where are the people who are writing about education and how terrible we teachers are, where are they when it comes to researching that? Then there's a guy named Bob Panoff. When he says algorithmic thinking, if you're a teacher who only had that stuff that went to seventh grade, you say, what? But when he finishes teaching you, and then there's a whole curriculum he has free. But how do teachers know about it? When people write about education, they write about teachers. Why don't they write about great programs that have been funded? And then one last thing. The computational sciences are not being taught. You say teach the high school teachers and give them funding. But you know what? I started in fourth grade. I had five Google scholars with money out of my pocket. What would happen if we started, as this gentleman said, at fourth grade and encouraged people? There are people standing in classrooms right now who would do a better job if we had broadband for everybody. I work with Native Americans. We haven't mentioned them. They can't even get to the school two hours to the school, two hours back. What about the people in rural areas like Alaska? I worked up there. We aren't talking to everybody. We're talking to the people with broadband. Let's make sure that we do the broadband and do K-12, not just. I want those science teachers to be fabulous, yes. Because I go to, you know what, I go to all of those meetings up at the National Academy of Sciences, I get so excited. Then I come back and I write them out and I get three people who answer. But why aren't the reporters doing their job? Why aren't okay. they sharing the Okay, I think we have your question. Uh, Charles Giancarlo Sorry. actually helped write the broadband plan for uh, California, so maybe you could address yeah. Yeah. broadband. In no, I think broadband, broadband ha is a, uh, a huge challenge for rural environments. Uh, there's, there's no question. And, and without, I think, um, you know, fairly active um, engagement by either the federal government or the state, uh, actually, in municipalities, uh, you know, it's going to continue to have challenges in, in rural areas. I mean, the, the reasons are, are quite straightforward, uh, you know, which is that it's expensive, right? It's expensive to dig a trench, and when you've got it supported by tens of thousands of people in an urban environment, it's worthwhile digging. And if it's only supporting, you know, 10 farms, or, you know, it, uh, it, it's quite challenging for a private company to go about doing it. So, so it has to be supported by the federal, federal government and or state governments. Um, personal, there, there are, uh, you could read several of the broad, broadband reports. I think there's some very good uh, suggestions in there, but I think it's fairly clear that um, the, uh, uh, the whole universal service fee, which used to be applied to voice, really needs to be applied to broadband um, because just about everybody has voice uh, these days. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, you know, my 78-year-old mother, mother doesn't have a fixed line anymore. She's on a cell phone, smartphone, as it, uh, as it turns out. Uh, it really, universal service now needs to be, start to be applied to broadband. Right there in the aisle. Ray McGee, a uh, researcher at SRI International. It's clear that the challenges are, are huge and that uh, no one entity can address this challenge of STEM education by, by itself. And I'm just curious if the panel could talk about the potential of public-private partnerships. We've heard a lot about that. Even uh, Secretary Blank mentioned that earlier. Uh, what's, the, what's the practicality of these kinds of partnerships? Uh, we've heard partnerships touted uh, for a long time. And uh, public-private partnerships have, uh, I think, a spotty, a spotty record. Um, talk a little bit about the potential for yeah. the private sector and for government. Uh, including higher ed as well, too, to work together yeah. to address this challenge. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, uh, um, I, I've started several of those, and I've, I've researched them, and I think they're excellent. Uh, private, uh, public-private partnerships, I think, are excellent for innovation uh, of the model, uh, and I think it brings a lot of new ideas to it. But I just don't think the scale is there uh, or could be there to address the, you know, the problem beyond the one or, the, the one or two percent. I really believe that it's a, um, it, it, one additional thing is anyone in, in science knows when you have very long feedback loops, you often get systems that don't converge. Uh, and you know, the feedback, if you think about it all the way to K through 12, the feedback loop is 20 years, if, if not 30 years. Uh, and so you have to have a very far, reach, uh, far uh, thinking corporation that's going to invest that far, that far forward. And really, it's more charity uh, than it becomes um, self-interest. So I mean, it really is a societal problem. Um, it may, part of the challenge may be the fact that you know, we're organized in education on a municipality basis, and it's a national uh, challenge. 
and we have to address. Uh, we probably need to address um, the um, dysfunction that's caused, frankly, uh, by by that system that we have, and we need to come up with some national ways to be able to provide greater support uh, for um, for uh, for national uh, for areas of national interest. Jim, do you have any thoughts on public private partnerships? Uh, no, I was just thinking as Charles was talking. It, it, it's a funny conundrum. You see, the, the, the customers, big companies in, in this area, are not in charge of the training of their ultimate workers. So if you can imagine a company, let's say like IBM, let's suppose it, it was just located in one giant community. And it ran the whole community. In particular, it ran the educational establishment because it's only workers were going to come from this community, if we can imagine this. How would they do it? Well, they'd probably do a pretty good job. They were the customer. They knew how at least uh, th th these workers should be trained. They'd have the best people. They'd pay up whatever it cost. They'd have the best people out there doing the training. And it would all be sort of a unified, a unified operation. But it isn't. It isn't unified because the customers are basically private and the trainers are basically public. And how do you uh, make this, this, uh, cult, this thing work is what, uh, is what we're all talking about here today. So I don't have a, any more solutions than that one. Okay, uh, two questions uh, right here. We'll get to each of you. Hi, my name is Ariel. I'm a researcher at the Japanese trading company Kamitsui. And I don't work at the STEM field, but I grew up in China and had this entire science, math, oriented education. And I went to the United States for college, and I just graduated from Vanderbilt, and I majored in history. So it's a completely different kind of experience. So my question is, um, is there any kind of a momentum or initiative for international cooperation to solve this um, shortage of uh, STEM job or you know, inspiring those uh, message delivering in the US? Because my experience in China taught me that you know, studying STEM field is really highly respectful. And um, it's even kind of a survival um, matter that if you don't study STEM and um, you don't have a future. But so in China, there's kind of access of engineer or mathematicians. They, they want to be in that field, but here it's a kind of opposite um, situation. So I'm wondering whether there's any, you know, U.S. government-related, um, uh, you know, initiatives that cooperate with international government like China to kind of try to keep a balance of this, so. Well, I don't know of any programs that directly fit what you're saying, um, but I think what really happens is a more natural system. Namely, uh, the good news in all of this is we are still bringing a lot of extraordinarily talented people from around the world to the United States to be part of our nation and part of our leadership. And so I think we learn from our colleagues who have grown up in different cultures, how it's viewed. And what we try to do as a society is is, uh, you know, let the best of all of this boil up. So I don't know of any fancy programs uh, that are uh, directly being supported by the federal government to do this, but there's a lot of informal uh, exchange back and forth, including just to, to give a, a, a sort of funny personal example, uh, my counterpart in China right now, in the People's Republic, uh, as uh, president of the Chinese Academy of Engineering, just stepped down as Minister of Education in China. So we talk a lot about this. <laughs> Interesting. Well, there is one government program I know of, which is the H-1B visa program. Uh, and if we, if we increase the number of H-1B visas, I guarantee you we will get more STEM uh, graduate students and workers uh, in the U.S., without a doubt. Okay, right there in the aisle. Hi, my name is Jamie Schock, and I'm a reporter and editor for the American Society for Engineering Education. So you can probably guess who my question is for. Um, Dr. Vest, it has been my experience that um, it's difficult getting engineering into curriculums on the K-12 level, particularly middle school and younger. 
but most of the, the teachers I've spoken to say, you, you gotta get them in middle school. You have to get them then or they're just, they, they lose interest. And I mean, 3.1% of, of girls say that they're gonna major in engineering. That's a really low number to start off with. And then you lose half of them. So how, how do we get more engineering into the curriculum? Not just extracurriculars, but, but actually in the classrooms. Just some very quick thoughts and observations. Um, the National Academies, plural, Sciences, Engineering, Institute of Medicine, uh, just a couple of months ago issued its framework for K-12 science and math curricula. And there's a lot of hope that this is going to have a big impact nationally in due course. For the first time ever, that framework has engineering as part of it. And my own view is the last thing we need to do, not everybody agrees with me, but I think the last thing we need to do is take a new subject called engineering and dump it on top of our teachers when we're already failing in fundamental science and math. But I think we need to do two things. Kids need to hear the word engineering. And secondly, basic engineering concepts. What's a system? How do you design things? What do you use these mathematical tools for? Are a wonderful integrating mechanism for what kids learn in more fundamental science and mathematics. And I think there's a lot of room for working in that direction. So those are the two things that I would like to see. I was told this morning at another meeting that CNN ran a spot today about a kindergarten in Maine, kindergarten, that had just given everybody an iPad. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm glad to hear that, but I'd be even happier if the teacher said, where do you think this iPad came from? And I mean, I think it's that simple, getting some of these basic concepts, letting people hear, and using it as an integrating and motivating thread through the way we teach science and math. Okay, on the aisle, halfway back. Yep. Hi, I actually want to build off of that thought with regard to messaging. Um, one of my concerns is I think that we start too late. For instance, what if we were to introduce the, the high maths, the engineering, in the Sesame Street program, you know, as one of the little Muppet people, as becomes a scientist or so forth. Because I know back in the 70s, Barbie became a doctor. Barbie became all of these things, and it changed the way girls thought. The other thing is, how can we get the toy industry to change some of the things that they do? For instance, you have um, the uh, connector sets and so forth. Why can't we create a component that's motorized where the children you know, build into that so you get that mechanical engineering component and so forth? Um, my other thing is, what are your thoughts about doing public service announcements where you, and I'm talking now, um, academia and corporations create video um, vignettes that can then be brought to schools during career days but start early. Um, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the YMCAs, so we can get our kids thinking and also parents. Well, really quickly, to your first point, I would just say yes. And to your second point, um, that's why I said I think the, uh, the entertainment industry is important to us because it's one thing to have public service announcements. But for kids, most likely it goes in this ear and comes out that way or maybe the opposite direction. I think where we can really message in ways that are helpful for engineering and for STEM in general is through the way companies advertise. You know, that can be a real mechanism. And, uh, t uh, and I think there's some good examples now on, on TV, Lockheed Martin, HP, some of them running really wonderful ads that gives you a sense of the excitement of the field. And secondly, I think our best chance, rather than public service announcements, frankly, is really to get in to the, uh, the real entertainment industry. And, uh, you know, we've got some people like Will I Am now who have really taken this on with a passion. He's going to reach a certain kind of, of kid. And uh, 
the, uh, I think you all know what happened to forensic science curricula around the country after CSI went on the air. <laughs> By the way, the producer of CSI was trying to do a new one based on computer science. He couldn't quite sell it. But I think ultimately those things are probably more important than what those of us that sit in this room can do. Uh, over here. Hi, my name is Ann Mills Paul, and I'm a researcher with STEM Connector. I was wondering if you could just talk about the cost of education, particularly in relation to underrepresented minorities uh, seeking two year degrees. Uh, just looking at for profit institutions and community colleges and the price increases that have occurred over the past decade, it seems like to ha have that type of degree, you have to incur a certain amount of debt. How do you see potential remedies for people who do want to have these degrees but don't want to, potentially want to have a job that makes them anywhere between $30,000 to $50,000 a year entry level, but at the same time will have that job at the expense of tens of thousand dollars of debt? In our panels, I say it's a, it's a huge, huge challenge. Um, I, you know, a, a number of um, obviously the state college. Uh, I, I come from a state that has a wonderful uh, state college system, uh, uh, Cal uh, Berkeley, uh, California, and uh, it's the case where if you if you um, maintain a B average or higher in the state uh, system, you're then guaranteed a slot in the four year. Uh, university system, but the state budget crisis has had you know just an incredible effect upon uh, education uh, in particular, where they've had to raise uh, tuition, and we have to be very careful as a society not to have a short-sighted approach where uh, we where we are funding. It, it's odd that now, but uh, it was always the case that we as a nation we were funding our youth uh, more than any other component of our society. We are right at the edge now of funding our senior citizens. Uh, and of course, going forward, the amount of money going to senior citizens will fought, be far in, in excess of what we'll be spending on our youth. And just seems to me, uh, you know, anyone who's looking at that system says it, we're, it's a recipe for disaster. Uh, back there, hand up. Hi, uh, again, my name is Kamsey McAdams and I'm the STEM director for DC Public Schools. And I'd just like to invite people to think a little bit um, broader about what you were talking about earlier, um, about the fact that public-private partnerships are pretty good at like the innovation, like getting kind of things going. Um, I was a cooperating teacher for Math for America in my former career as a decade-long math teacher in New York City Public Schools and in Oakland, California. And the concept of having the program last for five years is really critical. So I would like to think that these innovation partnerships as they come up. So if I'm here in DC and I'd like to have somebody partner with me to help maybe fund the STEM fair or a celebration of STEM teachers night, to think if you're in the private sector to think, don't just offer that partnership for one year, but think about offering it as a sustained partnership at, and build in some metrics. So. I've had conversations with Google and with Microsoft and saying, hey, we'd like to put more computer science in, this, in, the, in the classrooms or put computer science at all. They're saying, okay, we'll give you money to get it started and then if you can produce this terms of metrics, then we'll sustain you for years two, three, up to five. And I think that that might be a message that you all from where you sit could really promote in terms of not just doing like a one-off mm -hmm. and even yourselves as professionals, as STEM-based professionals, to not just go to the school and do the one day career talk, but then offer to go back sustaining that. And I think that, that would really help public private partnership become more about sustainability, replica replicability, and scale than about these one off innovation things. Okay, Jim, here's one of your Math for America uh, alums. So she's talking about sustainability, uh, metrics. What do you think? Yes, but she didn't ask a question, she made a statement. A series of statements with which all of which I agree. So, uh, <laughs> sure, you want to give people some runway uh, to work, and uh, rather than uh, a one shot and see how it goes and so on, you want to give, create that kind of stability. Right here in the front. 
Shimkin. I'm Paula Stern, and today I'm representing the National Center for Women and in Information Technology. And I wanted to go back to some uh, comments that have been made and reinforce uh, a point which I would like to hear you all address, which is the importance given our budget crises here of focusing on getting the biggest bang for the buck um, in STEM. We all are here agreeing on STEM, and I would like to ask y'all to uh, unpack it again and talk about computing, computer science, whether we are teaching it uh, adequately, or even is there a curriculum in the middle school where, as this reporter suggested, is the critical element, particularly when it comes to the women and underrepresented minorities. Um, this uh, issue is a state and local issue, unfortunately. I believe the federal government, particularly the Department of Education, really doesn't want to get in to talking about curriculum. But your study that came out most recently, which you men mentioned, uh, Mr. Vest, um, had a footnote in there about computing and computing science and the curriculum. And basically it said, well, it could fall in the math and it could fall in the science. And we're not really sure. So basically nothing was stated on that. I feel like we have to go further. Um, this is a, a, a science, if you will, which underpins all these job issues, which uh, Sec uh, Acting Secretary uh, of Commerce uh, mentioned. And I would love to hear you address uh, how we encourage either the state and local level, but at the federal level, you are all representing both the, a national agenda here to get computing in. We don't have, we have fewer and fewer people kids taking the advanced placement course in computing science. You're talking um, about girls? No, Oh, people. everybody. Oh, yeah, okay. Of any <laughs> color and gender and persuasion. And uh, it, it, this is a shocking situation. Now, they're trying and we're testing a redesign of the advanced placement uh, exam. It's um, being kind of stress test in college to make sure it stands up at a, as a college level thing. but. This, we've got a problem because even if we get a better computer advanced placement exam, we still have to be working all the way through. So I beg you to just so, let me play make a, with this idea. Okay, let now this is the first time we've thought. had a, an author footnote challenged at Brookings. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Let, let me make a, a couple of comments that will make you mad, but we, we've, been, we've all been agreeing with each other, so what's wrong with that? And we know each other, and I really respect what, what you do. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm personally not particularly happy where computing and algorithmic thinking came out in the framework. Yes. But let me tell you, and it won't surprise you, guess what happened? When the rough draft was floated, the economists want to know where's economics. The computer scientists want to know where's computer science. You, you know, you keep going on down the list. And so I do respect a little bit the sense in which it is they tried to remain fixed on the fundamentals, but I do think that computing broadly viewed has become very, very fundamental. So I wish it had had a little stronger point. But let me say beyond that, uh, we also have to be careful. Um, you know, central planning doesn't always work, telling people what's important and what they should go into. So I'm a big believer in the fundamentals of education. Notice I never said particular engineering discipline. I said engineering uh, and uh, said, said science. So when I graduated from university, there was no IT industry. Yet it was probably the biggest employer of my classmates. So we have to be pretty careful about looking at the current situation and worse yet in the rear view mirror and saying, go into this field. So I think we have to be very cautious about making, in this case, computing and IT a focus in and of itself, but we do have to give people the basic tools. And maybe in the spirit of disagreement, I'll disagree slightly with my colleague. Um, Good. In that I think computer science is, is probably, you know, the shop of the information age. In other words, you know, I, 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 I learned shop in, in high school. Uh, in fact, I thought the, the, the least valuable course I th thought I took in high school was actually typing. 
Um, and I, of course, what do I? What do, I, God, I, thought, well, I thought I'm not going to be a valuable class. I yeah, thought, yeah, yeah. Well, it turned out to be, you know, of course, a very valuable class. But you know, I did a lot in in, in the you know in the shop as well, right? Uh, and and these days, I mean, you know, we're not in the industrial age anymore. Very few of our high school graduates are going to go and become, uh, um, you know, uh, workers on a, on a an assembly line. Uh, you, you know, a, a um, computer science is going to be a very valuable discipline, regard, almost regardless of what they go into. And it may turn out that 70 or 80 years from now, you may be absolutely correct that computer science is going to be, you know, the shop of the next age, whatever that might uh, turn out to be. But at least for the next, uh, you know, uh, for a good period of time, computer science is going to be very valuable. And I think that. Uh, it should be a fundamental part of, uh, and by the way, I think we should bring back home ec, but that's another, another issue. Yeah, among kids, we've gone from shop to now Photoshop. Uh, yeah. But, uh, I'm going to make that the uh, benediction, but I want to thank uh, Jim Simons, uh, Charles Vest, and Charles Giancarlo for sharing their uh, views with us, and thank you uh, very much for uh, coming out as well.